welcome to the second episode of the Stop You Learn podcast. This is a sequel to the first episode that premiered October 11th, where I got to speak to Andy Abrahams Wilson of the highly anticipated film Dog War. As many of you know, the film Dog War follows a group of former military vets with very diverse backgrounds, from special ops to canine working ops, who use covert operations to crack down on the dog meat trade in South Korea. With me today, you get to hear directly from one of these heroes, John, a former paratrooper who has dedicated his retirement years to saving these dogs from the worst cruelty imaginable. So that was a long-winded introduction, but welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much, Jay. Well, uh, obviously, everyone's dying to hear what you're doing in South Korea. I know that from our conversation, you've been there in South Korea for about 12 years uh, through multiple trips. Uh, but before we delve into that, I would love to hear a little bit more of the, about your personal background, how you got involved with the military in the first place. Uh, was it like family pressures? Was your father in the military? That, that sort of thing. So. so my father was in the military, served two tours in uh, the Pacific in World War II. Mm. My brother uh, was in the military. He, uh, he actually recently retired from uh, active military service. He was in the reserves uh, for 30 some odd, 40 years. He was a Vietnam vet. So it was kind of in our DNA. Uh, when I was 18, many, many years ago, <laughs> um, yeah, I won't tell you how many, but Me too. <laughs> uh, um, I had a, my brother had just come back from Vietnam. And I had a personal tragedy in my life, and I was kind of searching for myself. I didn't know who I was, what I wanted to do. Military became my way of life for, for a, a little while. So um, I left. One day I just told my parents, and I left, and uh, I joined the military, and, uh, and it was the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. No. How, how long did you serve in the military? I only served three years. Um, and it was in a very special place. Uh, I was stationed in the Middle East, um, and uh, uh, it was an interesting time in the Middle East because it was from '73 to '76. Oh, okay. And if people know their history, um, they know that there was a war in the in the Middle East at that time. So, uh, but it was a very interesting time. Um, I came back to the United States. I worked, uh, went back to school. Um, and I became a police officer. And um, at that point in time, I said, you know, I really like this, but I want a, I want a good life. And I didn't exactly always stay in the parameters of the lines that are drawn for, for individuals. Uh, uh, I was never good at keeping to the rules because I always thought that there was something outside of the lines that uh, needed um, special help or protection or right. special attention. So I quit being a police officer, um, continued uh, working with them. Uh, I did a lot of canine things at that time. My experience with dogs goes back to when I was very, very young. And so um, one thing led to another. I ended up in my own business. Okay. And I started my own business and it was very successful. I did it for well over 30 years. Um, in that time, it grew. Um, it allowed me financially to do all the things that I wanted to do to help with animals, particularly with dogs. Um, on one particular trip, I saw the, the cruelty to animals and uh, to the dogs, and I made a conscious decision that I needed to help change. And uh, um, that's how I got into this. But it was your business me. related to dogs, or no? It was not at all. Okay. Actually, it was a completely, completely different type Nothing of business. Nothing to do with it. Okay. Nothing to do with, with dogs. Um, but uh, it led me from uh, Thailand to Cambodia to Vietnam oh, to okay. uh, Taiwan to China, and then eventually to South Korea. I never had business dealings in South Korea, but I had business dealings in Singapore and in Thailand. 
and Taiwan and Hong Kong. So it kind of tied everything in because those were the countries where I saw the greatest need for what was going on yeah. at the time. So I guess uh, from you, you discovered about the dog meat trade long before many of us have. Uh, because for me, it's a two year, like I've only known about the dog meat trade for two years now. So we're talking about 2017. And those years where you were traveling and you got to witness some of this cruelty, what year were, were those? Like a, a it was, it was in the 90s, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, wow. I, got, I got to see firsthand. At first, it wasn't about uh, dog for consumption or cat for consumption. I had heard about that, but I never actually witnessed it in those early years. Okay. It was more about cruelty to the animals, the street dogs. Uh, you know, they would be randomly poisoned, or they would be beaten, or they'd be dragged behind cars, or things that you know that I that I actually saw was right. going on. And so it took for us to, for me, to step in. Um, throughout those years, obviously, I've had, I've maintained relationships military-wise, and so, um, and, and developed new ones, people with the same interest as me. Um, and when it came to dogs and cats, um, and other animals, horses, donkeys, things like that, we all figured out we had the same compassion. Right. We all had the same interest in stopping what was going on in the cruelty. Um, at the time, I was still eating meat when I first got into this. Um, well, like many. I, <laughs> right, I immediately stopped. And oh, wow. um, it, it, it's been a long journey. People, because I hid what I did for so long from my family, from the public, from my employees, from everybody, um, everybody wondered why I was became a vegetarian. You know, they always wondered, no, why, why don't you eat meat? Yeah. Why did the change happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I would say for health reasons, without wanting to get into details and... Well, it's uh, a valid reason, right? So it's, it's valid, obviously. Um, if you want to reduce your risk of a heart disease, you know, not eating... It, it is valid, but for me... Um, it wasn't the truth, you know? <laughs> I, was, I was risking my life anyway, so it really wasn't... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. How for the health reason, but at the same time, it was it was essential right. because, as I tell people even today, I don't save even one animal to kill an animal. So no. it's by choice. That's my choice. I don't push that on people. Um, I I don't preach, but at the same time, I try to educate and right. then let them make the choice themselves of what they're doing. And this is this is hard when you're talking about being in regions like the Middle East, like Iraq, like right. Afghanistan, um, it, it's, it's very difficult because meat is a, an essential source there. And, and it, it is as well in the other countries that, in Asia that we right. travel to, but it's not quite the same because, believe it or not, they have, a, I have found that the Asian countries have so much to offer in the way of vegeta vegetarian. Yeah, it, it's out. It's unbelievable. You never have to eat meat. No, you never have to eat meat. It's no. it's it's crazy. The and 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 they survive that way because of the lack of meat to to to, to, to slaughter. I think often look so, younger. <laughs> yeah. So, so so it's just it's been a choice, but the journey's been a it's it's been a long one. Um, it's been a very good one. Um, I'm I'm glad that uh, I am still very active in it at this point, and we're gonna we're 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 continuing our mission. Well, that's amazing, and uh, like I have a lot of respect for you. I mean, obviously you you fought uh, for the freedom of your country. Now you're fighting for the freedom of these dogs. So a lot of respect for you. I'm sure viewers at home are agreeing with that. Uh, so I guess uh, you answered my question when you first became aware of the dog meat trade and at the time you said it was the 90s and it was mostly in Thailand where you were traveling. Correct. Um, Thailand, Taiwan, which has since, you know, banned the dog meat trade. So that's wonderful. Uh, Taiwan, that is. And Thailand has eradicated a lot of it, you know, um, I guess uh, setting up some uh, spay neuter clinics, you know, they got rid of a lot of the overpopulation of stray dogs. 
Um, so they're they're. It's doing still just, there, but it's not as prevalent. It's not as prevalent. That's right. But when we first got there, when I first got there, there were stray dogs everywhere. Oh my god! Yeah. I mean everywhere, and I even coming out of my hotel, I'd have dogs follow me, and I would feed them and and you know befriend them. Um, it, it was a very interesting, and, and 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 a lot would hang around the the Thai temples and things because right. the people were very generous and would would feed the the animals out right. of respect. I mean that's yes. what they did, and then it it became quite obvious that things were there was a a a, a subtone in the society. And I'm not quite sure when dog consumption became what it is now mm -hmm. or what it had, but when we got involved, it was, um, we found that the dogs were being rounded up for all the wrong reasons. They were being rounded up and pets being stolen. Dogs were being transported across Cambodia to Vietnam. That's it. So Vietnam is we, a big country that they consume a lot of dogs. Uh. Dog meat. Correct. Correct. And, 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 and those countries don't, a lot of places won't even claim that it's a dog. Uh, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll claim it's something else. They'll claim whatever. But, it's, but, it, but they don't put dog. And um, as we have found out, that's not the case. It is dog. And um, we worked very diligently to stop the roundup of dogs in Thailand. And uh, this is before any of the other organizations even set foot in, in Thailand. Soy Dog, all the other, they're, they're, all of a sudden, one, on one trip to Thailand, to, I noticed there were all of a sudden three or four different agencies, American agencies, and I'm like, where'd you guys come from? <laughs> and it was like, ooh, you know, this is great. This is absolutely great, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. But, how did, you know, what's going on? And so I got to know a lot of them. Some of them are still exist today. Some of them yeah. don't. But they all have the same thing in mind, that, that to stop the, the killing of these dogs. Yeah. So very good. Um, obviously, uh, you reached out actually to me after the first episode of the podcast uh, premiered. And you were telling me that you would like to come and talk about what is actually happening in South Korea because you feel often the stories that are fed through social media and other news wires are in some cases fabricated and in other cases it's just grossly exaggerated. Uh, like for example, we heard about the Gupo dog meat market being shut down in July of 2019. And so I think you're in the best position to tell viewers at home, what is the situation in South Korea at this point? Um, dog meat is still prevalent. Uh, there are dog meat farms. Uh, I think, <clears throat> how many dog meat farms would you say are in South Korea at this point? So the government estimate is 17,000. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> but but let, me, let me put some clarification in that. Okay. Uh, I've met with the government starting uh, probably um, in about 2008. I started meeting with the government. Um, okay. They they had wanted nothing to do with us. I was uh, in South Korea. I'm not Korean. I'm a foreigner. <clears throat> they uh, they looked at that as an outsider. I'm just a plain outsider. What the hell are you doing in my country? Type right. of thing. But I was actually I found some open doors and started to make some slow progress. Um, the government estimates that there's 17,000. Now, here's, here's where things kind of don't work out. A farm is considered, in Korea, anything with two dogs or above. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, there's no way for the government to even estimate how many farmers have two dogs or four dogs or six yeah. dogs that live in the countryside that that you know um, that kill dogs for their personal consumption, but also for selling to restaurants that are in that area. And and I have found there are a lot of those. And I I my personal estimate is that there are more than twenty five thousand farms, and mm. those include the the two dog numbers. Um, okay. It includes the ones with a thousand dogs as well. So 
if that's the way that they want to define a dog farm, and personally, I want to define it as anybody who slaughters a dog, whether yeah. it's one dog or a bug even. Because right. to me, you're farming because you're going to go get another one. You're yeah. using it as, uh, as, as cattle. You're, as you're fueling the industry, you know, like... That's right. You're yeah. fueling the industry. So you should be included in that, in that estimate. Right. So, so it's I, like I estimate that it's, that it's greater than 25,000 farms, but again, as we have seen, many of them are so hidden in the back country, nobody's going to count them. No, and no one's going there to shut them down either, you know, because no. they're so remote and obviously people tackle the big uh, known farms. And um, so what would you say at this point or is the general attitude? Because you've been through diverse trips, you know, multiple trips in 12 years. That's a lot of time. Uh, spent in South Korea, surely you've uh, encountered, like you've had local in uh, interactions with the local uh, population. And what would you say is the attitude of dog meat uh, towards the dog meat trade in South Korea? I'll let you answer that. You know. So I'm going to break this down into a couple of different categories. Um, you have the experienced older generation, um, anywhere from 90 years old to, you know, 50. Let's just put it in that category. Right. So there's a 40-year difference there. Uh, people who were who were 50 were at the very tail end of the Korean conflict. All that. Right. Um, people who were 90 were involved. There was World War II, the Chinese, the whole thing. So there was a lot of starvation, a lot of things going on. People needed to survive, and um, for whatever reason. People feel like they need to have meat in oh. order not to starve. In order not to starve, which yeah. is you have the land in front of you and and you have all these things, but but meat seems to be a something. Staple. Yeah. Yeah. So so you have that generation, then you have a generation that's kind of split, and that that older generation they all know about killing and slaughtering dogs and eating them. They don't all participate in that. But there is a very large group in there, especially men or women who think that this is the best health benefit for their man at 80 oh. years old that yeah. to be, you know, little, have a little veracity in <laughs> his step and, and in bed. And so you've got that generation. Then you've got the 30-something the, the to 50-something to generation. Um, that generation, generally the, the 40 to 50, um, they are very well aware of the dog meat. They've tried it. They've had it because their grandparents or their, their, their families had it. They're not going out of their way to eat dog, right. but they don't avoid eating dog, and they don't look at it as something that they shouldn't do. Okay. And many of them have their own pets, like like the very much like the, the, the slaughterhouse owners and the butchers there, they may have their own dog pet that follows them around and, oh you know, and, you know, and they're killing dogs all around, them. but crazy. they have this dog that they take yeah. home and sleeps in their house every night. But so it's, it's hard it's, to understand, right? So for it's, us, very, it's very, very difficult. And we've seen it personally. We've seen it many, mul multiple times where the, where the, the butcher or the owner of the farm has a dog, and that dog goes is their family dog. It's their family pet. Oh, my God. Okay. And they go out every morning, and he goes and kills dogs in front of this dog, but that dog just hangs around with him. And wow. so, you know, it's just he got attached to it. But he doesn't feel that, that heartstring, you know, where, where all of a sudden, wait, I've got a pet. Maybe this could be a pet. No, this is yeah. me. This they, is food. They've, like Andy was saying in my first interview, he said there's a, really a divide. Like they feel like a, a dog, a meat dog, is not the same as the pets that you, obviously they have pet stores, I think, in South Korea. Uh, people, yeah. but they're smaller dogs, is that the case? Um, like in China, I know you're allowed to have a pet, but it has to be a very small breed of dog. Oh my God, who's saying hello to you? <laughs> That's this is Gracie. 
and I saved her. She was shaved at the Moran Meat Market in South Korea about 10 minutes before she was going to die. Um, oh, my God. She's a purebred Border Collie. And people who, are, who argue with me all the time, oh, you didn't save that dog in Korea, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I've got the, the pictures and video. Yeah. It doesn't, purebreds, they, they don't care if it's a purebred dog. They don't care if it's a mix. They don't care what it is. But oh my God, she's so beautiful. It's a she? And she is a smart, smart dog. Oh, wow. Like, she's yeah. like, a, her name's Tracy, right? Grace. 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 Oh, wait, oh, well, thank she, you. Amazing Grace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, pr pretty much why I named her that because um, uh, my partner took her out of the Moran meat market. Um, it was a very ugly situation. You know, we don't need to go into details, but she's a long haired dog and, and their death is very gruesome. So, um, they, they, they burn off the hair while she's alive or they, they will hang, they hang her by the neck and take a blowtorch, blowtorch off all of the hair on her and, uh, gut her or skin her alive, cut off her paws, uh, while she's still hanging there. Yeah. Oh my God. And you were able to rescue her at the last minute. She was literally rescued at the last minute. And was so her partner? We knew that she was a stolen dog. We knew that. Oh my God. And, and it was very, very obvious. She understands commands. You, you, you can tell. I've rescued three. Two of them were stolen pets. Uh, I have an English setter as well that I rescued uh, personally that was a stolen pet and um, didn't belong in a, in a cage with dogs that were raised in that cage and was starving to death. And literally uh, had pneumonia, was starving to death, and we saw her and immediately knew. We've got the video. And the first time we saw her, yeah. <clears throat> we knew that she she was forced to be surrendered. We made the farmer. We were in there with the police at the time. She was. They, we forced him to surrender her to us. And unfortunately, we can't save 100 dogs at, at the time. We weren't there. We were there to to make a report, get the police to see what was going on on this particular farm. So, um, but... Um, Can I say, uh, ask you, because you said you managed to force the farmer to surrender her. Correct. How, One of the things is we do not pay for dogs. We, we will not yeah. pay for dogs. Right. We do not want to keep this industry going Probably. by paying for dogs. We don't buy dog farms. We don't pay for individual dogs. We crossed the line that the Koreans and a lot of the American groups won't do. Oh, no, we won't, we won't do this. Mm. It's not a matter of crossing a line and breaking the law. It's a matter of humanity. It's a matter of how you're going to, to save this particular dog, this particular right. animal. Are you going, is it in your heart is a law in your heart or is the love and humanity in your heart? And that's what you have to look at. So we put ourselves at risk all the time. We've had confrontations all over the, all over Asia. Right. It's been, uh, <clears throat> and not just South Korea. You're saying uh, other uh, countries as well. We had issues in, in Thailand. Um, we've had issues in China. Um, we've, we've come close to being, um, lynched. And that, and that is the way, the, yeah. the word I will use, because when you have a mob of people who are chasing you, yeah. and, and they have only one thing in mind, um, it is that, that. and uh, you're disrupting their financial ability and their, 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 their business. Their business, which to me is not a business. No. Uh, if your business involves killing uh, live beings and like torturing them, that's not a business. <laughs> no. and, and if people, and I want people to understand that if, if you're going to have an argument to say, hey, why aren't you, you know, what's the difference between a dog and the way these people raise dogs as, as livestock and cows and pigs and, you know, why are you only doing this? And it's a, and I will tell them flat out, this is a choice, my choice. We will save whatever we can, what it, whatever situation calls for. Right. Dogs are not livestock. Right. 
And if you want to say that that culture treats dogs as livestock, you are an uneducated person who has no idea that dogs were never livestock, never intended to be livestock. They were intended to guard herds, yes. to protect the livestock for the farmer, not the opposite way around. It was not meant that this dog was going to be raised. This was a culture that started very small and grew. It has nothing to do with starvation. It has nothing to do with the lack of food. Right. It has to do with the killing of an innocent animal that we as humans domesticated and not for food. No. And that's why I tell them, look, they treat cattle. There are rules, even in South Korea, even in Thailand, even in China, that govern the slaughter of cattle. Right. There are no rules that govern the law of slaughter of dogs and cats. And particularly with dogs, it is because they supposedly have this myth about being Viagra, uh, right. stamina, uh, sexual enhancement yeah. for men, which there is no proof, there's no evidence. There, everything scientifically has debunked that. And it is, it's, it's not something that, that when someone says to me, this is their culture, you should stay out of it. They are very uneducated, and usually I call them the keyboard warriors, who yeah. we know who they are, and they have nothing. And when other people say, well, you're bringing diseased dogs over to the United States, in fact, that is not the case. No. Uh, we are bringing dogs that have been fully vetted. Exactly. Shot, rabies shots, yeah. I mean, every disease that you can imagine. Um, we, we, we neuter most of them, we spay most of them, but, well, we actually neuter all of them. We spay yeah. most of them, but depending on their age and what, you know, if, when we bring them, what, whether or not we can neuter them. Okay. We have never had a diseased dog come to the United States, and we're very proud of that fact. We quarantine them, we do everything in, over there. Yeah. We don't quarantine in the United States where people think, oh, that dog needs to be quarantined for eight weeks. Not true, not even close. Um, be and because, by the way, sorry to interrupt you, but before you can actually fly a dog, you have to meet a lot of uh, health protocols. I mean, you can't just fly a dog that has full of disease and infections. You can't do that. They won't allow you. So we have to take every dog yeah. to the government office to receive its health certificate. Exactly. Every single dog, and we have to have all the documents with us. Yes, that it's very severe. You know? The, the vaccination, the sticker off the label, yeah. all the things that, that have to be in order for us to bring these dogs. So these people, and by the way, and I want to address this too, because there are some other people out there saying, well, why are you bringing dogs from Korea? You know, we've got enough dogs in the United States or Canada or wherever in the shelters. There are over 30,000, 30,000 registered shelters in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who can be helping with, with that. Dogs do not know a border. They don't know you're Korean or you're American. Mm -hmm. They don't know if you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim. They don't, they don't know religion. They don't know race, creed, color. They know nothing, and they don't know a line in the sand that says this is a border. So what difference does it make if our efforts are both in the United States Yeah and somewhere else because to us we take the same philosophy that an animal would have it does not know a border no. it has no it knows humanity it knows kindness and it knows cruelty and those are the things that we look at absolutely and not just that like i i've had uh, that argument too because uh two years ago when i first learned about the yulin dog meat festival I got a lot of pushback locally because they were saying, well, listen, it's their culture, you know, don't mess. It's not your problem. It's not your, your concern. And, you know, we kill cows here. And, you know, I understand the argument. I'm vegan. I totally get it. Farm animals are, are abused as well. And it's, it's not good. You know, it's a, an appalling situation. But I would say... And, and, and we both would stop it if we could. Yeah, and I know but, that. That's it. We are trying to do so much. I mean, there's so many vegan groups out there trying to educate the public, right. you know, about the hazards of uh, meat consumption, whether it's health um, 
angle that you tackle the environment there's a lot being done for to promote veganism and to promote kindness towards all animals but i i i've told them and and like you just mentioned it's not like they're replacing the cows with dogs and it's not because they have no other options because dog meat is in my opinion or from what i've learned it's actually not cheap and the poor people actually eat beans and rice they're more vegan than you know the That's rich correct. Um, so yeah, so there's a distinction, and also the the point that you brought up out that you know dogs are not meant to be consumed. So on that front, since you know a lot more about this, I wanted to touch upon the history of dog eating in these countries. Um, I know China has had a long history. Uh, I don't know about South Korea. I've I guess it's been around for ages, but yes. Let me let me let me dive into this a little bit. Um, China dogs were eaten. Um, it started again. I'm gonna I'm gonna blame this on on religion. Um, dogs were eaten in the 1800s when the first Catholic missionaries landed in China, oh. and. The source of food, there was no food. They, the, the missionaries, ate meat. Okay. And that was their. That was a big thing for them. So in China, when when there was starvation and um, drought, in China it's a very very large country in different yeah. aspects of it. It can be, it can be. Uh, there can be ten year droughts that go on in certain regions. Um, like in South Korea. <clears throat> the the priests gave their consent to the villagers to consume the family dog that was guarding the herd because there was no herd anymore. Right. It was the only meat source. So um, there were no random street dogs. Things like, dogs used to run, and, and a family never had a, a leash or collar or anything like right. that. It knew exactly where its home was. It knew what it was, you know, it used to sleep in the fields where, where the herds were. And once the herds weren't there because of a drought or whatever that was going on, um, it became a f source of food, not for the Chinese and not for the South Koreans, but for the priests. Okay. And so if you trace this back, it has nothing to do with their culture. Now, what has sprung from that is you have Koreans now that say, oh, I ate that dog, and wow, I, I, I felt better. so good. I, uh, I felt like, you know, this is, excuse me, I'm going to adjust this a second. <laughs> no worries. We don't want it to fall on you. <laughs> By the way, this is one of John's paintings because you're um, a painter as well, like it seems. So. It's, it's therapy. <laughs> it's therapy. <laughs> My painting doesn't like me at the moment. It's 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 really it's therapy. I uh, um, oh, it's I try to paint to 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 release everything that I feel. But well, that's another story. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, tackle that later. <laughs> so 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 what happened was that they started writing. They started keeping books about how they felt after they ate a dog. Mm, okay. And so they started writing in the in the night in the early. Our late 1800s. Oh, hey, I, I, sexually, I was a better man. I slept the oh. night, and in summer, I felt so much better eating dog soup. My, I was, it was like air conditioning, you know, well, not air conditioning, but I, my system cooled down. In the winter, it keeps me warm. Wow. Uh, you know, so all these myths started to to really start, and then you had people writing, and you had these guys who would write down. Uh, all the benefits of eating dog meat. And right. that kind of, it, it was a very small population in both China and in, in Korea because they, they didn't have drought. They still had plenty of cattle. Then comes the invasion in South Korea, the Chinese. Mm. And, and starvation starts, everything happens. Well, guess what? Even their own soldiers at that point were needed food. And so... Guess what they did? They would slaughter a dog, serve it to everybody. And that, and it perpetuated, and right. it grew. Yeah. And it just, it was a matter of, 
um, during the during the the Second World War, right? Um, when the Japanese came into Korea, the same thing happened. The Korean people, you can you you see the images of of people refugees of no food. This that well, cats, dogs, donkeys, horses, Whatever. anything that was a meat source, all of a sudden became for survival. Right. So this, so out of that, then they went from one conflict directly into another conflict with the Korean conflict, and again, starvation, this and that. So, right. so you would think that there weren't a whole lot of dogs. There were dogs in one place in Korea that were protected, ever from from okay. even from the very beginning, and that was Jindo Island, oh. where the Jindo dog originated okay. from. Oh. It was illegal, illegal to transport a Jindo dog right. off of Jindo Island. It became the national symbol of Korea. Outside of the government building, you'll see a picture of a Jindo, uh, a statue of a Jindo dog. Hmm. You have a conflicted, conflicted society where but you make this animal your national animal. Yeah. And you're eating it. Well, that is very, uh, I didn't know that at all, but what made them uh, not kill the dogs in, on the Jindo Island? Like, what was They were considered the... sacred. Oh, okay. They were, the Jindos were white. Um, <clears throat> they were brown or black Jindos, which have come through um, uh, a lot of breeding. Right. Uh, right. Were considered bad luck. Hmm. White. White Jindos were pure. Are, were pure, the spirit of, of God, of Buddha, and all these things. So, so Jindo dogs were, but then they started getting smuggled off of the island to the mainland. Mm. That population throughout the 60s, 70s, if you got caught, there was, there was a lot of fun. But the government didn't do anything to stop the breeding of the dogs on the mainland, and it grew. And then with... As the, the economy it, from the 70s and 80s started to churn in South Korea, um, and it did, it became, South Korea became and still is one of the tech countries in the world. I mean, right. you look at Samsung. technology, yeah. you look at their cars, yeah. you look at all the things that they're producing. Right. <clears throat> so you have this unbelievable high tech country. Right. On one scale, and on the very bottom of the scale, what do you have? You have this generation of people who are killing and eating these dogs with a black heart. They have no heart. They have they, they have a black heart is what we call them. Yeah. Uh, black hearts are people who have no feelings whatsoever for the life that they're taking and how they take it. Yeah. Now people tell me, and and um, I will, I argue this point with them all the time. They say, well, why would, why would a mass slaughterhouse, who's mm -hmm. who's probably killing a hundred dogs a day, why would they torture, why would they spend their time torturing a dog? What's yeah. what's the point? Yeah. Well, here's something. I've been in a slaughterhouse. Um, and I want to tell anybody out there who thinks that that they don't tor torture dogs in a slaughterhouse. It's not true. Yeah. Uh, they will they will take a hundred dogs in a day, and they will hang them. Uh, sometimes on hooks while they're still alive. Um, sometimes by the neck on a rope, which is more of the case. Um, I've seen workers go by them and pick up a bat and beat the dog as they walk by. Um, they leave the dog to hang. And I don't want anybody who hasn't witnessed this themselves to come and tell me that this is a myth that they torture these dogs, even in a large slaughterhouse. No. Because it has, it has taken, it has made badass men um rethink their lives absolutely i know what you mean i think there's enough video out there there's enough graphic images to support the fact that they do torture dogs
whether it's South Korea or China, there's a torture element because, like you said before, they have a misguided, very disturbed um, thinking that a tortured animal, the more adrenaline runs through their blood, the better the meat. Um, tougher the, the tougher the, and this is what I've been told by, by Koreans and Chinese, the tougher the meat, not yeah. the, you know, Americans want their meat tender. Yeah, it's the opposite over there. The tougher the meat, the more um, sexual enhancement a male will have from the tougher the meat. So, I mean, if you really want me to go into this, first of all, just so that to let people know. Right. Um, we do not stand by and watch a dog be killed. Um, no. If we are covertly doing something, or even in the open, where we've had cameras, our camera goes off, and we will go Rest intervene in that. Okay. We, you will never see a video from any of us that 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 of a dog being slaughtered. We, I could not personally. I can't. I can't. I can't do it. No. Um, a camera. It doesn't mean anything. If the dog's life is more important. Yeah, than exactly. I this you. image. That, that is so hard for you to ever get out of your head because right. that's all you're doing. So we don't, we do not video animals being killed. Um, if we have someone with us like Andy who, um, who has a camera, I do not expect him to put his camera down because that's what he's there for right. is to give that view. Um, but most of the time when we go into these situations, uh, when we've gone into small slaughterhouses like in Moran, or when we've gone into Gupo, um, or anywhere else, we have never, ever filmed it um, and because watched the animal you, you see something happening and you, you act to uh, stop it. We have, we have saved animals in China, we saved them everywhere, and been chased by people with machetes, people with bats, uh, axe handles. Uh, we've been, they've tried to run us over. Um, we have we we have had just about anything thrown at us that you can imagine. They've picked up rocks. They've picked up. I I I've, I can't even tell you, because we have literally stolen the animals in front of them, and the crowd has been incest, and so they they want to kill us at that point. Of course, yeah. You're so, you're ruining their business, their way of making a living. So yeah. So let's talk a little bit about about Moran Market and Gupo. Right. So, um, in, in 2015, actually, the end of 2014, um, I was in Korea, um, and I was there to gather some proof for a government official about a, a particular farm. Okay. I was introduced to a group of Korean women. Okay. And um, they were all advocates. Um, each individually, no big group, anything like that. There were no, there were no groups. At that, there was, there were small little things popping up. Right. But in in 2014, so what happened was, we ended up, they ended up taking me to a government office in Songyang, where where Moran Market is. Right. And um, I sat down with the officials. Um, I had a translator. None of the women spoke English except for one if you spoke a little bit. Okay. Um, which I, I'll tell you a, a funny story that came out of one of the meetings later on. But when we met with the official and they voiced their concerns, right. um, he pulled out a plan for Moran Market. And that plan on that map was right. to make Moran Market into a, more of a tourist destination. Hmm, and 2014. This is in 14. Yeah. They were going to, the government was, realized that, you know, slaughtering dogs in public, you know, having these, he's, these slaughterhouses on property, and we've got video of the slaughterhouses. We've got video, uh, drone video, flyovers and things that you'll see in the, in the film. Right. Uh, dogs being killed, you know, they're dead already. But we know that this, they were in that slaughterhouse and they were being put into wheelbarrows and then onto motorcycles to restaurants. But so in 2014, and this was probably 
It must have been April or May of 2014, so it was still early. Okay. Um, we had this meeting, sat down, and the government official explained that they were going to, they were eventually going to um, shut all the uh, slaughterhouses down except for chickens, um, rabbits, uh, and I don't remember what else he said at the time, but it was just the smaller animals is what, ducks, oh yeah, ducks. Oh, wow. so, 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 so he said that the plan was that they were going to relocate the vendors. Right. So I asked, on what kind of time frame are you going to relocate them? And they said, well, we hope to have this completely done in the next three to four years. Oh. We want to take and turn these, these, uh, uh, the, the front, uh, and he showed me a drawing, which is similar to what is there today at Moran, but it's not the exact same. They were going to do kiosks, individual kiosks, not attached to all one building, but individual kiosks. Yeah. They were going to knock down this building, the main slaughterhouse, and a few other things, and they were going to do individual kiosks and make it into a very touristy resort. Mm. Not sort of destination, right? right. Where you get a real feel for Korean market. For a tourist attraction, you know. Very much a tourist attraction. Yeah. This is, this is 2014. So, um, two years later, we happened to be in Moran. We were the only Americans and the only Korean group that was at Moran when the pro-meat president, the official, and the, the activists at that time who were not there, the government official was there, um, they started, and we have video of this, where the cages were actually being blowtorched and taken apart, and you know, welders mm -hmm. were outside, and blah blah blah. They made this big scene about it, right. and this was uh, in 17 uh, January, okay. had, or February, the first week in February. So they made this big deal about it. Well, we have the video. Um, as it turned out, the killing was still going on. We went back that night. The killing was still going on in the back room. We found out through the contract, the original contract with the government to relocate the vendors, right. that they offered every vendor out of their lease, right. they would buy them out and pay them $2,400 a month for them to move from uh, Moran Market mm -hmm. to a location which is about a half a mile away to, to set up shop there. Wow. There was no outlaw. They weren't being shut down as no. every group has reported throughout Moran, never got shut down. All they did was relocate okay. and get paid $2,400 a month to subsidize them while they were redoing their business, building okay. their business again. So that's what happened in Moran. In 2017, when we were there and we filmed everything, two groups came out and said, Oh, we've got this. We worked out a deal with the government. You know, they're going to shut down Moran Market. Blah, blah. I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on? What are you yeah, talking about? The plan took place in uh, 2014. It was already in, in motion, right? So you're like, it was already in motion. It was there. Who are you to walk in here and, and, claim, and claim that you that you had some? So at that time, I called both groups out and I said, okay, let's see the contracts. You say that you had something to do with negotiating what you did, how you shut down Moran Market. Yeah. I call bullshit. I call bullshit. I, I say, I want to see a contract because I've talked to the government official. I've been back there twice yeah. since you. You tell me, where in the negotiation do you see my name? Because it, it's not there. We didn't negotiate anything to get no. it shut down. No. This was a plan by the Korean government to create more business because they knew that killing dogs in public was driving tourism away and creating problems for tourists who didn't know anything and were taking pictures and the, the, the uh, butchers would come out yelling at them with knives and machetes in their hands and the tourists were like, what did I do? Wow. That's because they were taking a picture of something that was happening that they knew was wrong. Mm. So I was so, cleaning up their image, you know, that was the whole right. point. So, so what happened was, I called bullshit out on them about Moran. Right. They had, didn't have video. We had video of everything happening with the, with the, pro, the president of the Pro Meat, uh, Dog Meat Foundation. We had all these things. We still have all this. 
So I have backup proof right. on, and it's not just you know crap that I'm telling them. This is what really happened. So these other groups claimed that they had something to do with it. They used it as a fundraiser. They used it as a propaganda yeah. machine. They used it. Well, guess what? In those same plants was Grupo Market. Mm. That they modeled Grupo exactly how they did Moran. The $2,400 a month payment to the individuals. Right. Guess what? The same two organizations went in there and claimed that they had shut down the market. Now, I'm going to name one of those groups and I'm going to call them out because I have said this many, many times. Show me the contract. Right. Show the world the contract that you negotiated to shut down the meat business, the dog meat business, because I know for a fact that you didn't shut anything down that this was in the works for a very long time because of what was happening in public and that society is changing in Korea and they wanted to make Gupo, just like Moran, they saw how it was working, they wanted to take Gupo and make it into a tourist destination in Busan, not something where it was, people would show up and be, oh my God, what is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Humane Society International, I will say it again, I want you to show the world the contract that you negotiated and say that the market at Gupo and Moran have been shut down forever. Yeah. Here's the tail end of this story. They used it as fundraisers, and believe me, they've done some great things, and I want to call them out on both the great and the bad. Okay. They <laughs> used this as a fundraising effort, which is unbelievable. They've got a huge PR machine, and they need to keep that PR can, machine Can going. I just ask you a question before you go yeah. on? Um, because, okay, so the, it was initiated by the government, uh, according to your meeting in 2014, it was already in the works to clean up, you know, the image of uh, South Korea uh, sure. to attract more tourists. But I'm assuming HSI did rescue some of those dogs that were on the premises because, you know, they did no. bring back dogs uh, to no. the state. Okay. No. All right. So they did in Gupo, from what I understand, but not in Moran. They okay. didn't touch a dog in Moran. I know that's that in 2017 fact. in Moran. Oh. Okay, so. 2017, February 2017 in Moran. Um, they did not touch a dog in Moran. No. Now, it, it wasn't just HSI in, in Gupo, but there were a couple other Korean organizations that went in, at, and they're the ones who really organized and initiated getting the dogs. Okay. The question is, and still has been the question, I can't get anybody to give me a straight answer, did they pay for those dogs? Because mm. I know that, uh, that the market, the only way that they were going to get those dogs away from those butchers and slaughterhouse was if the government or they themselves, the rescue organizations, paid to have those dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, with the government, it could possibly have happened from the government's subsidy of $2,400 a month, and that group said, it's easier to give up our dogs than to move them. Right. That's a possibility, but nobody will provide evidence. Nobody. Not, not HSI, none of the Korean groups will provide evidence of how they obtained the dogs at Google. Okay. They're, they're claiming they rescued it. They went in with, there must have been 30 to 40 individuals who were there to help rescue the dogs, right? Okay. But, but nobody will give me and tell me, did you pay for the dogs or okay. did the government subsidize them? Because I've been doing this as long or longer than most of you. Yeah. There's no yeah. way that you walked into Gupo Market and said, we're taking your dogs. There's, there's no way that happened. No. No, zero. Okay. And they were gonna stand by and let it happen. Right. So, anyway. So, I have, I, I, I'm calling out these groups that say that they were instrumental in making Gupo go away. I'm calling them out. I'm calling out anybody who has that, because the fact of the matter is the Korean government was already doing this had nothing to do with them. Right. Um, these, the, the, the butchers and slaughterhouses at Google have relocated, um, and we're trying to find the location of where they are setting up shop, and, and one of the missions that we're doing when we return on our next trip is to 
covertly find out where these new situations are because they, they didn't stop anything. No, they, they kind of moved out. You know? still proliferating. It is still happening. They're still yeah. getting, uh, the, the restaurants are still buying from the Myanmar. Individual families are still buying. So um, there, it is, it's just total crap. And until HSI proves me wrong, and, and I've called them out social, on social media, stop taking credit for things that you don't do. Okay. And that's what I've said to them. That's fair, I'm but I'm very you said, uh... naive when it comes to this point. And, and, I'm, and I'm calling them out on it right. because I need their help. We need their help. Paying for dogs is not okay. okay. Yes, what we do sometimes goes outside the lines legally, right. but, but we have never paid for a dog. The farm that we recently took down with 48 dogs, we show you pictures, we show you video, we show you how we got the dogs away by embarrassing the man who was the mayor of the town. Okay. Taking these dogs and make and, and tell basically what would be called blackmail, saying if we're going to expose who you are and what you're doing, and you're not going to be a mayor anymore, you're going to be shamed in, in this society for what you're doing. We actually got those dogs within four months, and we have the pictures. We demolished the farm completely. We brought in a backhoe, took down the farm, sold the, the cages as scrap once they were broken down. We gave the guy who broke down the farm for us. He got to haul away all the metal and turn it into scrap, never to be used for dogs again. Okay. And then within four months, we had the community had planted soybean and rice. Okay. And you documented from beginning we to We have a whole, we have everything, start to finish. And Every, can, can the public see these, uh, this footage, or is it available yeah. somewhere? I mean, it, 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 a lot of it will be available in the film. Okay, yes. perfect. You can see it. But we never, and this was not the first time, but this is the first time we had a film crew with us that had actually witnessed what we, right. what we do and how we do it. Um, we will use action. Um, and again, and I understand the, the, the donor base and the, you know, the membership at, at, of HSI and all the other. I mean, there, there, there are people going, oh, wait a second. You, are you saying that you're going to, go outside the law yeah no and, they can't they have to work within certain parameters or they're constrained but, on that front but i want to get back to you said earlier on that you forced a dog a meat farmer to surrender his dog how do you go about doing that like you just threaten him or like I don't well, know. there's different ways um yeah there have been a lot of threats a lot of times um i'll be honest right uh, we, we don't shy away from conflict mm -hmm. when it comes to saving a dog. Um, so what we've done in a lot of rural areas is we contact the local police, who we also know, one, many of them eat dog, but at the same time, uh, some don't. But they are also capable of receiving a bribe. Oh, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> So we are not above bribing the police in order to gain access to a property okay. to see the conditions. And I'll be honest that even when some of these police have walked into the dog farm and see the conditions there, they freak out. They, they, are, they have no idea. Wow. The, I mean, I've seen them actually get sick, physically sick. And yeah, these are local uh, Koreans. And local not Korean yeah. police, correct. Yeah. Correct. I have actually seen them get physically sick to their stomach. And it, and by the way, this didn't just happen in, in Korea. This, I followed the example we set in Thailand and in Taiwan right. and, and, and uh, not so much in China, but, but those two places where the police came with us and they went, Oh my God. What, yeah. what is going on here? Is what, what is this about? And, and, and so when, we took these policemen in, and we were documenting everything. And, and again, I'm going to tell you that Dog War, the film, will have one of these instances specifically. Okay. Documented where we took these dog, and, and I and we put, brought the police in, and when we saw that this dog was a stolen dog, we immediately confronted the farmer. 
Um, while we were there, I stole all his tools without him knowing. Uh, what's your tools? Yeah. Um, I did things because it turned out that he had a, a one of the officials came running down to us and said, "We need to leave right now." And I said, "Why? You, we need. To, we just need to leave." Hmm. And I said, "I'm not leaving." What, what's the problem? Yeah. Well, there were there were a pile of dogs in the back. And he had never seen anything like that. And the farmer used them to grind the dead dogs down um, for food. Oh so piled up next to a, basically a grinder type thing. And he lets them um, get to a condition and then he just grinds all the carcasses up. Oh and, and he feeds them to the... So, so the, the official, the government official did not want to see it, but we had already, already documented everything and we knew that. So when we when we saw that this one dog was a stolen dog, there were actually two of them. There was another border collie there, but we couldn't get it. Um, we forced the farmer to give us the dog. And then what happened was the next day we went in and met with the farmer. Not the next day, maybe a couple of days later. We met with the farmer and the government official, and um, we were negotiating to buy the farm. Right. But no intention of buying the farm. We wanted to know. We wanted it was basically to gather information: how many dogs he had, yeah. uh, you know, how long he's been in business, does he own the farm? But well, what we found out was that he was renting the land. He didn't own it, so he okay. couldn't sell us anything because we were told him we were looking to build a sanctuary and and this would be a great place for us to do it. Right. And he wanted fifty thousand dollars for the farm. Hmm. The farm is on a main highway. Outside of a major city, wow! It's it's on the highway, and it used to be open, and now he's got barriers set up so you can't see what's going on inside. Above, up on the hill, overlooking the farm is a restaurant. Mm, no. They don't sell dog meat at this restaurant. The owners of the restaurant, when we went there, yeah. had just gotten a a little golden retriever. And we were outside sitting, and we were observing what was going on downstairs, and we knew that he was killing dogs right then and there. Okay. And we turned to the owner of the restaurant, and who had the dog, and said, do you know what goes on down there? She was like, no. I, what do you mean? I don't know. I said, they're killing dogs. What? What do you mean they're killing dogs? Wow. I said, they're killing dogs, and, and they could steal your dog, and your dog ended up down there. She did she, have no clue. She was, she freaked out. She, she was like, well, we hear dogs scream every now and then, but we just think that they're fighting or something. I said, no, they're not fighting. He's killing dogs. That's a dog meat farm. She turned white. And, and if she, she, was yeah. she young? Like uh, this yeah, restaurant? Yeah, she was young. She was young. Okay. She was there with her mother. But wow. she was probably in her 20s. Wow. She freaked out. Yeah. So she had no idea. And she had just gotten this little cute dog. Golden retriever. Yeah. So, um, obviously, she was against this. I thought you were going to say the dog meat farm was supplying that restaurant. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. no. It was not supplying that restaurant. That's what made this even more interesting was because she was appalled by the fact that they were serving dogs, that they were killing yeah, dogs. Yeah. There. She had this beautiful dog. And she was, she, I said, this dog, you better be careful because yeah. it could end up down there Not too far. being skinned a lot. And she, she, she was, she freaked out. And would you say that the local activists that are more at the forefront of this fight, they're younger or for the most part? Yeah. Or well, no, actually, a lot of the Koreans that we work with are, are of different, many different ages. Okay. Um, some, some are older. Um, for a matter of fact, one gentleman that we work with is, is close to 70, and um, he, he is, um, basically, he found um, himself through dogs, and he used to eat dog, and he now is very much fighting against this. Wow. So, he has his whole philosophy... And he has saved a lot of dogs, and um, he he grew up eating up, and he never saw anything wrong with it. And then he found 
God, so to speak. And um, now he is he's very active in the community as a private citizen. Um, he supports many of the, the causes there. Um, but, you know, you've got, a, they, they really do range in age. One of the things that we've been doing and, and uh, uh, we did recently was um, education at a university um, and teaching younger kids about dogs and pets. And, and one, of the, one of the first stories I ever heard in Korea um, was from a, a, a man who used to be a dog farmer. He was, he was probably close to 80 at the time. Um, and he told me the story about how his grandchildren um, asked him why he was killing dogs. Oh. This is not the first time. I mean, I know that that in the film you'll see there it's the same, there was there was a similar situation, um, but he realized that what he was doing was not right and. Oh. He, he stopped. He just literally stopped. At and 80 years old? Or no, like he recounted the story when he was 80. Okay, so that yeah. changed his mind because his grandchildren are younger. They're more, I guess the yep. younger generation is much more exposed to Western culture. They understand right. that dogs are companions. Right. So 80% of the Korean population live in apartment buildings yeah. and do not have large dogs. No, that's right. Right? So they have small dogs in their pets, but they do not see the difference between a small dog and a large dog. They, they are all the same. So when you are killing large dogs, they imagine you're killing small dogs. Now, small dogs are killed in mass quantity there, um, used as snacks or appetizers. Um, so the younger generation is becoming very attuned to this. And want, we had one translator... Um, who got physically sick when he saw what his and he was he was crying and was upset that his country um, did this that his that his fellow Koreans were capable That's of such crime. Well, it's a crime, you know. Like let's call it what it is. It's it's it is a crime. As far as we're concerned, it is a crime. Yeah, it is, it is a crime of the heart, of the mind, of the soul, and of mankind. Yeah. Uh, and like Andy uh, and I spoke about during the first episode, he does, and a lot of people say this, it's a generational issue and that progressively with time, of course, it will die down, like this dog meat uh, business. Uh, but you brought upon, like in our earlier conversation, that not it was not being filmed. I spoke to John earlier and he told me uh, there's an African swine flu at the moment. And you feel this is putting the dogs in direct uh, danger because obviously if they can't eat pigs, they're going to have to substitute with meat and dog meat is very prevalent. So you fear this will fuel the dog meat uh, industry even more. I don't fear it. I know it. Yeah. And that's the problem. So African swine flu has been in North Korea and has come across the border. Right. Uh, when we were there three weeks ago, uh, the government had... Um, quarantined uh, a large part of the area south of the DMZ all through the border because pigs, wild pigs, and everything had come across the border. Um, and uh, whether this is by design by the North Koreans or accident, who knows? All we know is that in certain parts of South Korea now, towards the border, uh, thousands and thousands of pigs have been put to death uh, yeah. because of the African. Swine. So, right. So, um, if their source of meat disappears, mm -hmm. then dogs become a prevalent source and cats become a prevalent yeah. source. And this is what my biggest fear right now um, is: is that this this could turn out to be a very, very bad situation uh, in the upcoming year. So uh, we're hoping that the South Korean government can get their hands uh, on this, control it, manage it, and uh, reduce it. But um, they're obviously not going to get any help from uh, North Korea. The World Health Organization is involved now. Uh, 
the military green military is involved in coordinating cordoning off certain areas of uh, northern South Korea uh, towards the DMZ. Um, and you don't see reports coming out a whole lot about it, but um, it has been reported. And I think that the, the South Korean government is censoring it now so that it doesn't send a panic through the people. Right. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that they have an idea of how to contain it, but all it takes is one infected pig. Yeah. And, and it will be a disaster. And, um, this is a disaster in North Korea right now. And so, it's a and and you're flying back soon uh, to South Korea. I guess you're gonna have your work cut out for you. <laughs> you got our work cut out always. for us. And um, I do want to throw this in here, Jade. Um, I wanna I wanna tell people that an organization um, that we work with and that, that we're very familiar with, uh, Canine Global Rescue. Um, you can they can look them up on the yeah, web. I've heard about them. Yeah. Yeah. They can. They are. They are. They can support them. Uh, and their efforts, um, and again, uh, we associate ourselves with groups that we believe are doing the right thing, not paying for dogs, not doing things that are right. going to be doing, and that's one organization that, that could use the support of, of many people uh, to continue their effort and their fight. Absolutely, and we'll link it up uh, in the description below the video so people can, a lot of people know about Canine Global Rescue. I've just learned about them recently. Uh, but it's a, it's a well-known organization and they do good work, like you said, so we should all support them. Um, so I guess I would like to hear from you. you. You've mentioned that you've been working, trying to rescue these dogs in South Korea. It's a, it's a difficult uh, mission for sure. Um, you've also been critical about certain organizations like HSI. If you... Like, let's say you would become like a nonprofit, able to take donations from the public. How would this change the way you go about doing things? Um, would it change? Well, obviously, you couldn't. Uh, you couldn't bribe uh, police officers. I guess you, you'd have to change. No, actually, we could. You um, could. Okay. The, the, the difference is that we would let it be known to our base, uh, pretty much like Canine Global Rescue does, that our base would know that that. We do whatever is necessary. We will break the law, but we're we're at risk. Our donors aren't at risk. We're the ones at risk. So, so we want to make it plain. And and there are people out there who will say we believe in stopping this any way you can. And so you know, I'm not just giving my money over and over and over again to to a group that claims to be doing it. I'm giving it to somebody who I know. We'll do whatever is necessary to, to save them. Yeah. Just stop and seize an end to it because you can't just keep this going. This is this. There has to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And as 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 many times we say, you know, um, we we take those out of darkness to the light to see the light. And we this this is one of those things is that. If your ethics don't align with the fact of what we're doing, they don't expect you to pay. But if you, you know, to donate. But if you know that that what a group stands for ahead of time, and and you're aligned with that, or maybe you're aligned but don't want to admit it, then that's one of the things. You know, um, we get asked all the time, "Would you hurt a human being in the process of saving an animal?" And I answer this very specifically. If, if my life is put at risk, or any of my team are put at risk, or I see something happening that needs to be stopped, yes. Yeah. I, I think will. a lot of us would. I mean, I the will. same situation if you see a dog being abused in the public street. I can't just walk by and, say, and do nothing. All That's day. exactly right. And I've done that where I've seen a dog in public where someone kicked the dog, and I went over and took the dog. And I got into a physical confrontation. Yeah. Now, it's going to happen, and I don't expect everybody to be in that. But I've been told that we live by act vicariously through other people because they want to do what we're doing. Right. They can't. So we're the group. 
we're the guys, we're going in and doing this and stopping something that is happening. We're not filming it for, for, to put it on the web. And you know, we don't want you to see the images that we have in our heads. Yeah. We don't, you can't ever rid yourself. I've seen guys, and I've told you this, I've seen badass experienced combat vets with multiple tours see the worst humanity has to offer. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of that, you know, now that we brought upon that point, the psychological impact of doing the work that you're doing, I mean, personally, I've seen, like I said, I discovered about the Yulin Dog Me Festival two years ago. I wasn't sure what it was. I thought it was fake news. And then, of course, I researched it on Google and saw like horrible images, dogs being blowtorched alive, dogs being bludgeoned to death, uh, you know, forced into a vat of boiling water. You hear the dog scream. And so that alone is traumatizing. I had sleepless nights. I couldn't get it out of my head. And this is across a computer screen. So I can only imagine being there physically in person to witness this, hearing those screams, it has to have a debilitating effect on you. And I don't know how you guys manage to do so well. I'm assuming because you've already been to war, you've seen your, your fair share of trauma. Do you think that better prepared you for this mission? Or is Nothing it still- prepared. Has... Anything. Nothing prepared Nothing. Jade, I wasn't prepared the first time when I saw it. No, the first time I saw a dog hung, beaten, and seen alive, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. Um, I was not prepared. Um, I'm still not prepared. I get very emotional. Um, when when we saved the English setter who now lives with me, because yeah. I take it to her so much, she she I, and and Gracie, the border collie that now lives with me, and little Jindo. Analyzing me, um, I get very, very emotional thinking about what could have happened to those dogs, yeah. and about the dogs that I can't save. Um, that stays with you. It stays with me because I see their images, and a lot of times I will see their images in a dream, and uh, it's just uh, it's hard. <clears throat> sorry. Um, it's, it's difficult, difficult for me because, because I can't save them all. No. Uh, no matter what we've seen in combat, no matter what any of us have lived through, I've seen some real badass guys yeah. break down. And I've literally, we've had to comfort each other. And I say comfort each other because when somebody um, has a, an emotional breakdown who's been in combat, We've seen the worst war has to offer and then sees this and completely loses it. Yeah. It's it, it can take three days, it can take a month. And, and all the other feelings that they've had about war in general can yeah. string back. This, I've seen this happen to individuals. It triggers it. Yeah. It triggers everything more. They can't. They, they see an innocent animal being tortured to death for no reason. Exactly. No reason. Yeah. It triggers something that none of us are ready for. And I, we're never ready for it. The difference is that we're willing to do something about it. Yeah. That we're willing to put ourselves out there to keep other people from having to do that. Because not everybody can get on a plane and go to Korea and do covert no. missions. Or <laughs> Definitely not. Fun, right? Yeah. We've all got specialized training. Yeah. We've all we've all um, encountered the worst humanity has to offer. We just want to end this. Yeah. It's about ending it and finding a solution to end it. We will continue to advocate with the Korean government. We will continue to advocate with with the Chinese government. It helped, really helped in Thailand. And look what happened in Taiwan. Yeah. I mean, this, it was a major influence. Now, that said, there's still a gray market and a black market for dogs and cats in those areas. Yeah. 
Well, we knew that would happen, but the ratio of how many dogs were being killed has diminished dramatically. And in the coming years, with the generational thing that Andy talks about and, and talks about in the film, that will die sooner or later. Well, we've taken it from 100% down to 5 or 10%. Which is huge. I mean, that's as, as good as it comes, you know, like... Like anything that you outlaw, there develops a black market for it. Exactly. exactly. And we know that that's going to happen in Korea. Right. And, and we know, know that we're going to have to monitor that and, and do something about it. But, but here's the difference at that point. The government, if they ban it, yeah. will completely turn a blind eye to what we do outside of the confines of the law. Do you stop it? Yeah. Because it's it is illegal. illegal. It is illegal. Yeah. So, so right now, they turn a blind eye, whether it's for dollars or, you know, Juan or whatever, they'll turn a blind eye um, because they don't like it and some of them detest it, but they haven't been able to stop it. Right. And as we have found out, one of the government officials was actually friends with one of the farmers. Oh, boy. Right. It's probably not the first relationship that forms. <laughs> no. Definitely not. But um, so, in your opinion, what is it going to take to put an end to this? It's working with the government, trying to make it outlaw, or is it instilling animal welfare laws? Because I, I, I just want to take a time to read this uh, this piece. I live outlaw. You would say outlaw. The livestock law that they passed in. Yeah. No. Um, look, what, what is it's going to take? take? One, it can't be categorized as livestock. Right. Dogs, not livestock, and it never intended but to be livestock. But they're not even categorized as livestock, you said, because there are no laws to protect or govern the, the killing of dogs at this point. They're not uh, livestock, yet they're being slaughtered like livestock, right? Or not being exactly slaughtered worse, worse than livestock. Worse than there, livestock. there are no laws to govern anything that a farmer has. There are cruelty laws in place in Korea, more so than in China. Okay. Cruel, how an animal is killed, but they do not abide by those laws, and the government does not enforce it. Okay, because that's the, the law I saw, uh, the Animal Protection Act. They don't explicitly prohibit the slaughter of dogs for food. However, it prohibits killing animals in a brutal way. Public. In front of the public, that's another part of this um, act. It says, in addition, it forbids killing dogs in open areas such as streets. In front of market, other animals of the same species. Right. Where, market, where the Google and the Moran market, market came into play with that law, because that was one of the things that we used in our first meetings with the government. Okay. It specifically says this. We took pictures of and video of dogs being, you know, in their cages. We, we, we could not get into the slaughterhouse, but we could hear the cries of the dogs and they were being killed. And the government officials were. So they were breaking the law at that yeah. point. The government would find them. A hundred thousand won. That's okay. nothing compared to the profits they made, yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what it's going to take? Complete and total transparency from every organization that's working on this. Stop using it as a business. Yeah. Stop using it as a business. Do it for the humanity that it was meant to be. Stop. And I'm asking, I'm begging every single group, Korean, American, stop using this as a business. Dogs are not a business. This is something that makes me sick to my stomach, that they are being used as a business tool to keep your organizations alive. Well, Start so advocating. Mean the pain of the dogs, for the dogs. Like you're not only just paying of dogs, yeah. but... You know, the, the, the way that they are approaching this. Right. Making yeah. announcements that are not true. Make, you know, doing things, saying things that they have not done. And okay. to give you an example, one example of this, where the market relocated from Iran, we did a covert action. We knew it was there. We actually showed Andy uh, through the film, you'll see. Um, we knew that that was there. I went back to the government with a group of five women, and this was in 2018. Okay. 
beginning of 2018 and, and said, said, look, all you did was relocate the, the slaughterhouse. Yeah. The city at the time said, you know what? We're getting rid of them. We're going to turn that area into a park. Right. What? You're what? We're going to take this area and we're, we've already, we bought out all the leases for these people individually and then they're going to move somewhere else. But we have one person who was holding out. He took them to, they had to take him, they paid him. He could accept the money, but he wouldn't leave the property. So, uh, the slaughterhouse. So, they, we knew that the slaughterhouse was After he finally lost in court, two years later, he lost his case with the Korean government. Okay. Finally removed to the court. We went into that place right before he left and filmed. But, but not only that, that, HSI and one of the Korean groups went in after every single dog was out. We were filming it, live streaming it, claiming that they had something to do with the dogs being, with the slaughterhouse being shut. Yeah. Completely fabricated, only for one reason. They, they couldn't find a dog in there. They, they couldn't. Later, they admitted that when they got there, there were no dogs. Okay. We, we had known that this place was going to be transformed to a park. They claimed they had something to do with the government changing it to become a public park. And both groups. And um, they need to stop that. They need to advocate. They need to take the money that they would be paying for dogs. Yeah. And they need to take that money and they need to start spending it to, to to hire the right people in Korea to advocate, just like lobbyists in the U.S., to make their Congress, the Korean Congress, understand the significance of continuing the dog meat trade. They need to make them stop. They need to take that money. But right now, all these groups are profiting off of saving dogs, whether they pay for them, or whether they're given dogs, whatever. They're, they're using them on websites, they're collecting a lot of money in donations and fees, and yes, they are saving dogs ultimately, but they're continuing the process. So, yes, you're saving this dog's life, and you've got a hundred more over here, which you just contributed to their death because of what you've done. So let's get back to what you were saying. What would you do? Like, let's say you're the head of HSI tomorrow morning for whatever reason. Well, well hypothetically, what would you do? What would you say that I would find? I would, I would, I would take, take not a not an American, American celebrity. celebrity. I would go and partner with a Korean celebrity, somebody okay. with a huge right. amount of influence on the culture, whether it's right. K-pop, whether whatever it is. Yeah, find like that, that individual. And form a coalition of people, Koreans. Yes. Koreans. It has to come from that. And, and most of them will do it for free anyway. But find a coalition of Koreans and Americans and Canadians and whoever else and use that coalition of powerful, powerful celebrity influence. Yeah. Sports influence and make a stand with the government. Take it and make a stand instead of continuing to do what you're doing. Okay. There is a way around this. They have the power to do this, Jay. They do. But they're not using the power in the right direction. Make themselves, I would tell Adam and everybody else at HSI, you take it and you make, you, I will give you all the credit in the world. Because we don't have, we don't know any celebrities. We don't have, but I guarantee you HSI can. I guarantee you that they have the influence that if they can, in the next two years, that if they can gather forces and then they can take groups like us and then along with them. We can call a, a, a truce, if you want to call it that. For right now, an amnesty to, to, to all of us get together and, and be on the same page, and, and take that and use the Korean people themselves yes. with the government, not the outside influence of what it is that we bring yeah. and how we feel, but how they feel themselves and use that going forward. That is something they haven't done. That is something they haven't accomplished. And that would work. 
Of course, of course it would work. work. Yeah. It's just a matter of time, right? Yeah. It's going to be a time-sensitive thing because the more Koreans that you get involved who have influence in politics, who have influence in, in media, this will turn the tide. It will turn it very, very quickly, especially if President Moon carries through on what he said his intention was originally. So these people will have an influence over whether he gets reelected. Yes. It is a big thing. So I don't, we don't have the political influence. What we have is the knowledge and experience to go in and physically stop this. Yeah. It's going to take more than that. It has to come from the people. I agree. It has to come from the people as it did in Taiwan. We were released totally out of the picture in Taiwan. The president, everybody else, we directed him how this could be done. And sure enough, it did get done. Almost almost to the, the exact way the script was written on how it needed to be done. Wow. So it, it, it's something that, that, that the Koreans have the influence and the power to make this stop 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 organizing protests on the same day at the same time in the same place every single week right. all those deep vendors do is they just you want to make an influence that that involve the example of like the civil rights movement in the united states lay down in traffic get a thousand people yeah we can't do that because we will upset people who, who don't eat dog meat and then all of a sudden they'll be eating dog meat. What are you talking about? No, you're right because a lot of these uh, strategies that you're talking about, the civil rights movement, they were infiltrating the, the, the people that were actually part of the problem. Exactly. And, and we do that, you know, there's direct action everywhere. Uh, I've uh, attended some of those events. It's basically making a stand, making a statement, and it has to be well organized, well, well orchestrated, so no one knows where it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. You get a mass of people saying the same thing and bring to the forefront right an issue that has to be addressed and you know it goes into the people's minds and they they become aware of it they they uh, they think so about let me, it let me, let, let me put it into perspective too, too. we uh, my, my experience in the middle east the spring, spring uprisings were spread, spread. The, the protests were all spread through facebook and, and, and social media not, not just not just facebook but social, social media the, the same, same thing can be done in korea you, you can spread this and, and in three days, let people know that if there's going to be a protest, not say where, yeah. but let them be aware. And then hours before, you spring that and you get thousands of people, thousands yeah. of people to stop traffic in, in Korea. You can get thousands of people to show up in, at, at the conference. You get thousands. I mean, look, HSI and other organizations cannot do this alone. They need the help and support of all these organizations. Yeah. I would ask them to stop the isolationism that they have created through their one organization. Stop it. We'll, uh, people like us will go away if this problem stops. So, so you will have your organization intact afterwards. But right now, use our experience. Use everybody you can from every area to help stop the killing and slaughter and torture of dogs and cats. Period. Yeah. And that's what I would ask. Well, on uh -huh. that uh, note, I um, I did interview James Chai, who um, lives in Vancouver. He has a foundation called Arf, Arf Bark Mark. He's been known like he's an amazing dog trainer. He uses nothing like conventional methods with shock collars. Uh, he yeah. understands uh -huh. the psychology of dogs. And he was saying how he proposed to an organization that they should come up with billboards, advertisement, making it uncool to eat dog meat, like all these, I, to, to break apart the myth that dog meat is good for you, that it, it, it's like it increases men's virility, break it all apart and make someone like a known uh, star, like like you said, K-pop in, in Korea, a known uh, celebrity in China, for example, that would you know, like say, I don't eat dog meat, you know, I'm cool, like just that kind of thing, because that's what influences change and the people's minds, their perception of the dog meat. And uh, you know what's going on in Korea right now on TV? No. 24, 24 hours a day, day there's two, two pet, pet channels. channels. Okay. <laughs> two pet well, channels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 
uh, it's like, like a young, young hipster, whatever you want to call it, type thing, where they show these pets and they discuss everything, and it's like interaction. Yeah. And they have this, yes, it, it, it is such. If, if, if these people knew what was in their, their own backyard, backyard and what was happening, yeah. so, so you're, you're right. right. And what, what I said was media. Right? right? It's one, one of the things they need to get involved is media, whether it's billboards or whether it's paid advertising, uh, you know, uh, the Korean government, government will censor showing dog, dog farms, uh, dogs behind the cake. I know that. So, so they, they have to have a different approach. Yeah. And, and, and at the same time, um, be able to touch upon the fact that dogs are dying, that dogs are being tortured, that dogs, but without the government trying to stop the censorship of it because they're you, you can't, can't you, know you know how the ASPCA puts on their little commercial about dogs in the United that commercial would be outlawed in Korea. Oh yeah yeah. Where you see the dogs tortured behind the the, 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 the cages and the, you know all that. That's not permitted. Yeah. Right? Not, not gonna happen. Not not going to happen in Korea. But there are ways to do this in billboards. Yes. Uh, media getting getting the celebrities to speak out, um, getting you know a direct line of communication. Yeah. I had I was supposed to have a meeting at the Blue House with President Moon. Oh wow! Three weeks before I was having the meeting, the Korean crisis happened with North Korea. My meeting got canceled, and and it was actually going to be filmed, and the. Meeting has never, never, I've never been able to penetrate that veil again. I've, I've been trying desperately to get back into the, the Blue House. I, I can't even get an email back anymore from the people who were going to put me in there because um, there has been so much pressure uh, put on President Moon uh, to, to get involved yeah. in that. Now, he hasn't said anything since he was elected in May of, of what was it, 17? He hasn't, he hasn't said, said anything. Okay. Nothing. Zero. Have, have you, has there, there been anything that you've seen about? Well, I know there was something going around where we were asked to, like, petition. pressure. Um, yeah, yeah, the petition and, and send him letters and this and that. The, the petition to the Congress, they needed to get so many signatures. It is something that the Congress does. And even if you accomplish it, then they come back and go, oh, well, you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, or this signature can't be verified, or whatever. So... So, so the, the, the politicians who, are, who understand the, the, the political and financial impact of the pro meat people, they are deliberately sabotaging every bill that comes into They're that. They're kind of in bed together, right? So are in bed together. They, they make money, uh, it's good That's for the correct. economy. So. There are bribes going to those politicians, and it is very obvious. Well, I, I do like the idea of, like, if you change the people's mindset, it's, that's going to make a change. Because in South Korea, it's a progressive, it's a democratic uh, political system as opposed to China. And, you know, like it or not, they kind of have to listen to the people. And at one point, if enough people stand up against this, I mean, I think that's... Come up, come up with an education plan to be able to go into elementary schools, junior high schools, high schools. Go, you can be able to present to them... Um, and, and, and you don't, don't have, have to, to strip their, their culture, no. right? All you have to do is don't, don't look back, look forward. How, you know, this is going on and how, here's, here's, here's my, here's my dog. Here, look at this dog. This dog can be used for children with disabilities, for service working dogs. This dog can be used for emotional support, for disease, for detecting disease. There are all kinds of educational things that we can do that, that the power of some of these organizations could help with finance. But they're lining their pockets. And I'm just going to say that. They're, they're, they have to pay so much money to the people who are employed that um, it's out of control. And it's, it's a big PR machine that just, just keeps raging on and on. Mm. But you so, mentioned earlier that you actually got to speak to a university crowd? Or? Yes, yes, we did. We, we spoke, uh, one, one of the guys went, went and spoke to the university crowd of medical, of uh, uh, veterinary students. Oh, okay. and, um, and, and it was a very, very, I mean, it was a very good situation. 
And yeah. he has a lot of How did of it come about? Like, uh, how did that get a, put in motion? Um, we, we were introduced through um, one, one of the vets at one of the hospitals, uh, one, one of the universities who's a professor. We were introduced to him. That, that led to this thing. And he said, would you come and speak to our class and do a presentation? So a PowerPoint presentation. So that was done. Wow. And are there plans to do more of those? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it actually, uh, we're, we've been trying to work with the province, the government province, to actually um, uh, work out where we can set up an educational uh, facility with land, with a veterinary uh, facility, and be able to kind of, kind of a sanctuary, but an educational thing more than anything, and trying to get that province just to outlaw to ban, and, and now we thought, thought we were very, very close to getting them to ban, and the the someone within the government there decided that it was not financially good. Hmm. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Somebody probably got paid off. Yeah, that's what happens. It, it's always the case that change comes about very slowly, sometimes too slow for right. our taste. Right. But it will happen. Uh, I think I'm confident in saying that the dog meat trade will be a thing of the past eventually. We don't know when. Uh, hopefully in our lifetime. I don't know. Do you think well, it'll be in our lifetime? I don't know, that, I don't I don't know, know what's going to happen in China. China. Yeah. Um, China is a, di a little bit more difficult. But um, South Korea, it's... a lot of people say South Korea will be the next country to yes. uh, make it out long. I, I fully believe, believe that. that. But, but again, again, I would call on, on HSI and anybody else. Um, and, and believe me, we, we, we don't want to cross American organizations in Korea unless they are flashing the hand. They, they come in, they, they make a big slash, they raise a lot of money, and then we never see them again. And it's happened at many times. So um, HSI has been consistent in at least the fact that they are there, but their methods and 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 um, how, how they, they do things, things uh, very much are different, different than the way that we conduct our business and, 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 and how we say dogs. dogs. Um, and, and I, I want to tell you, they're, they're, they're not a bad organization. I think they're just misdirected at the moment. I think that they need to find the direction and, and be able to, um, if they really want to put an end to this, and not just as a business, but yeah. put an end to it for humanity's sake, then they would foster the idea of joining, joining with groups like, like us and forming a coalition like forming a coalition, coalition and, and, and everybody with their expertise working and happen. And I would I would I would I I can't even tell you that if they if this keeps going on the way that they are doing their business right now, there will be no end in my life. Okay, so something has to change about the way they go about doing things, and they need to tackle like the issue with like more effective strategies. I agree, and you know, like I guess we can all do. We're all just trying to do our best, and certainly we commend you for for what you're doing out there. Like it's a sacrifice on your life, your family. Uh, we didn't talk about your family, but I'm assuming you might have kids and. You know, that's a whole situation. Fortunately, I, I, I hid it from my kids. They're all out of the house yeah. now. Yeah. I hid it from my family for a very, very long time. It was disguised because of uh, the location of my business around the world. Um, I came out to my family uh, a few years ago, and some of them were not in the least bit shocked because they know my passion and what, how I feel. On the other hand, there were a couple of my family, including my wife, who were uh, kind of angry because I put myself in harm's way for so many years. And they slowly over the years, stories have come out, whether it's me or other people, about certain things that happened that I've done. And so I think it took some of my family a little time for them to forgive me for not telling them, but for being involved in, in something that is so risky. And yes, I have been injured. Um, and, and I have to protect myself, myself and as, as we all have, have and, and I will continue, continue to do that, that. and uh, um, until, until I can't do it anymore. 
but I'm going to go to my grave. And I'm going to tell that I did as much as I possibly could. Yeah. And, I, and unfortunately, I may go to my grave knowing that I didn't stop it. Um, but but that, that there will be an end someday. So, so that's my hope. That's my goal. goal. Um, but, but yes, yeah, so my family took it took a heavy toll. toll. Um, it's very it's very hard to hide something this passionate and something that is so emotional. Um, but, but it started to make sense to my family too because of some of the dreams and things that I you know at night and things that were happening to me physically. Um, it started to add up to them what had happened and what was going on in my mind. And so it's the same with other guys. Um, I mean, some of the guys I, I work with that I've worked with in the past have hidden it from their families. Um, but um, some of us handle it better than others. Um, we find a way to put it in the box and, and until we take it out of the box, um, we, we might have to do it. And, uh, um, and like you mentioned before, you found a little bit of uh, solace in painting. Like uh, that, that. I paint. I paint a lot. I paint. I paint, um, I paint, I paint a lot. lot. Um, you know, nobody, nobody could figure out how come I was painting in squirts and how you know all of a sudden I painted these wonderful, cool things, things and you know I was either selling them or I was giving them away or, and, and people would people were like, like where do you get your where do you get your your creativity from? And, and I, I can, can never say, say you know, this is therapy. This, this is yeah. this is coming home from a mission, um, and what, what happened on that mission? And I would pull out canvas and I would start to paint, and I would paint until I felt healed for that time. And so um, this, this painting actually behind me was something that I did um, after. Um, our, our main mission when we went into that farm and shut it down. And uh, um, well, we, we have, have a lot of dogs there right now, now that we're trying to get out. out. And so uh, um, it, it, it's, it's something, something that uh, um, I'm, I'm glad that I can do this. Um, but not, not everybody can, can, like I said. Yeah. And there, there are different, different ways to participate in doing this. Uh, advocating, signing, uh, and I would encourage everybody. Watch the film when it's done, and if you can contribute to it getting to the final phase, yeah. uh, I would ask you to to go to Dog War and and to Open Eye Pictures and to help them because they're not making money on this. This is not a money making venture. This is this is a non uh, documentary that they're putting together to bring awareness. On a massive issue, yeah. On a massive issue that needs the attention of the world. Yes. Yes, there are starving children and around the world, and yes, there are, there's poaching going on, and yes, there's a lot of things in this world. Yeah. And then there's some things that you can help, and some things that you can't. And this is one of those things that there is no can't. You can help. Yeah. And so by supporting uh, Andy's efforts on making God War yeah. and, and getting this film finished and to completion. Um, making these kind of films is not cheap. And oh, no. it's not a video. It's a film. It's a it's film. Something. And we covered some of the costs uh, with Andy. Uh, so they need probably another 100000 to finish the film properly. Oh, right. That's probably about right. Probably even more than that. But... Uh, not to discourage like to anyone, um, they do have a good donor that's willing to match whatever funds they raise, uh, well, to up to a certain limit, uh -huh. of course. Yeah. Um, but yes, like uh, John said, if you want this film to be seen, and it can be seen, if Netflix could pick it up, Hulu, like a bunch of, um, you know, different mediums to expose the issue, it has to be seen by the world over because together we can make a difference. And numbers count, like the, one person can't change the world, but collectively we can all change the world. And this is something that you can easily get involved with, um, whether it's signing a petition, donating for a film like this to be seen and to expose the issue on a mass scale. That's something that we can all do. Right. And, and by the way, advocating, advocating to the media, yes. to Netflix, yes. to yes. HBO, getting, part, like writing to them, them and saying, hey, why are you not showing this? It's an important issue. That 
you can you can sit behind your keyboard. You can do that. That is something that you can get involved in. It doesn't take physical activity. It doesn't take a donation. It just means to really go out and advocate to get this film seen, shown, everything. If people have connections with with film festivals, things like that, this is a very important thing. It's about spreading the word about this film and what it means and and how how it can contribute. Yeah. to the education of stopping and banning the <laughs> cat meat trade. It, it, it can definitely do that. And, uh, and I would I would ask that anybody and everyone get involved to, to if you've got a passion, maybe you don't have a lot of money, it doesn't take money to be passionate. No, no. It's passionate to change things. And you know what we say in, in our businesses, um, Saving, saving one dog, dog may not change the world, but for that, that one dog, dog, the world will change forever. Yes, thank you. That's very true. Right? It's, it's the same, same thing. thing. Substitute dog with cat. cat. Substitute yeah. cat with, with horse, with donkey, with whatever, whatever it is. It, it makes a difference. difference. And, and so, so the one thing that you can do is is, is advocate for this if you can't can afford it. And if you can't afford it, I, I hope that in your heart that you will open up your, your, your wallet, your purse, whatever. And that, that every dollar that you give to somebody, you make sure where it's going. I always vet that organization very, very well. Make sure where it's going um, is being used in the, for the purpose that it was intended to be used for. Um, I know the Canine Global Rescue does that. I know that they put their financials on their website. So you can see um, you know, they're very transparent. And that comes, I think, with the honesty and integrity um, of, of being military, military personnel who really do have this passion and, and want to change the world. Um, uh, Andy with uh, Open Eye Pictures and the film, there's only one intention here. Andy's not making a living off of making this film. No, it's costing a lot of money, yeah. That's right. It is going to change the world, but it needs the help of all of us in this, everybody who's watching, anybody who's watching. Absolutely. So on that note, I guess we'll wrap it up. I am so thankful. I'm so grateful to you, um, John, for coming on the show and telling us about what is actually happening in South Korea, because often we're told a story and we're not sure, but you kind of laid it out for us uh, today. And obviously we're going to link up a Save the Dog film, I believe. We're going to have the website. You can help donate. Even if it's twenty dollars, if anyone gave twenty dollars, it would make a huge difference. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of money. Uh, rather than give it to, you know, like you know, sometimes we spend twenty dollars on frivolous yeah. stuff, you know, like so. Come on, we can all yeah. do this. It takes our collective effort, uh, like John said. And um, thank you so much for all the stuff. My pleasure. I'm glad that you gave me the, the opportunity to have a voice for the voices yeah. and. Uh, um, you know, uh, again, I would say Andy and and, and Open Eye Pictures, Canine Global Rescue. Um, I would I would ask that, that just open your hearts and your minds, and um, for all of those of you who who at this point in your time if you supported this, they're saying, well, I gave money five years ago, and I thought that this was going to end by now. It's it's it will end. But, but I do not, not want you to have to, to, to think, think that, that there is a quick answer to this, um, but, but there, there is an answer. And I don't, I don't want you to, to see things that are, that are news that are coming out about dog meat farms being shut down or, or, or uh, the markets and expect that this is going to change immediately. It's not. Um, it will change eventually, and I think that with the right influence it will change, change. But, but but give, give it give, give it time open, open your hearts um advocate, advocate in any way you can whether it's letter writing or, or financial but but, but don't, don't give up hope oh, no. because now those animals depend on every one of us yes. and and it, it, it's, it's something that whether whether there are animals in the united states canada or, or, or South, South Korea, Korea or wherever, wherever. They're, they're all animals. Yeah. They're, all, they're the same thing. They are. They they, they don't, don't know 
And all of these animals know the first time they touch the ground after being raised in a cave, just all of a sudden they come out and they are alive. I, I mean, I wish my dog were here right now, the one that I saved. Jesse! <laughs> Maybe she has <laughs> It's, I'm gonna, the, I, the I, transformation I, is amazing. This closing. Jesse! Come on, baby! I don't know where she is. She, she usually is a camera hog. hog. Oh, but, yeah? Oh, oh, oh yeah. She's having too much fun, maybe. <laughs> but she's outside, I'm sure. She's in the backyard because uh, it's a nice day before the snow comes. Um, she, 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 she loves it out there. Um, but um, she's. she's What's that? A lot of these dogs never felt grass, never felt ground. Oh, because, no. uh, although we did describe a little bit of the conditions in the first episode of the podcast, uh, these dogs are raised in wire cages. They're wa raised outside. They're exposed to the elements, the temperature, extreme temperatures. Um, and we go on farms, farms in, in the middle of winter, winter and... Yeah. Like frozen the, dogs. The, the food, the water bowls are frozen. The dog, dog is frozen dead, dead and stuck, um, and some, some dogs are alive, alive and barely. Um, and yeah. to that end, like, on that point, a lot of people have asked me, as intelligent people, were like, if that is going to hurt their profits, why do they put them it in the It doesn't hurt their profits. It doesn't hurt their profits. There's too many. They're breeding. They're breeding. They're breeding. And then they take the dead dog and they use it for food. How is it hurting their profit? You see, that's the wrong idea. Why would a farmer let the dog die? What's the point in that? Well, guess what? It's me. I know. I know that. You have another brood coming every four weeks, and the dead ones, all they do is take the dead carcass and turn it into food. So don't talk to me about profits. It doesn't hurt their profits at all. Okay. It doesn't hurt their profit line at all. It saves them from buying other food. Right. Okay. There we go. <laughs> you laid it out for us today, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, continue your good work. We're behind you in spirit. We cannot be there with you physically. Uh, some of us maybe. You know. Yep. You I, I hope. I hope Jade. Jade. I hope Jade. Jade you, you choose to come, come on a mission with us. Oh and, my God. And, and Is I, that we, an invitation? Because I think we I'm won't. We will not ever expose you to anything. anything that you, you should not or do not want to see, and I want to make that perfectly clear. We have volunteers who help us. Right. We will never do that. We, they tell us their expectations, and then I take it down a couple of notches, because even though somebody says, oh, I can go on a dog farm, I can see this, I know that they cannot. Once they're there, it is a totally different thing, and I will, I will take it down. I will take down the expectation of what they should see because they will never it's not like watching a video i can hit the button and turn the video off yeah if i'm there i cannot turn off my mind and that i do not and will never expose people to that so if you decide someday that you want to come with us yeah i would love for you to come maybe maybe for a matter of fact there's something that we can talk about on the side that's going on i might have some dogs coming to montreal sometime in not, not in the winter, winter but <laughs> because of the weather, because of the weather I can't do that, but, but there is something happening there, and maybe you can accompany and be an escort back from seeing some of this stuff for yourself. And, uh, and, I, and again, I won't expose you to anything that, that, that you should That my mind is not ready for. <laughs> No. Well, on that note, I guess if I'm invited, I'm sure other people can volunteer as well. We're going to link up some uh, Canine Global Rescue, uh, Save the Dog Film, uh, dot com, and Open Eye Pictures as well. And we all want this film to be seen, so let's do it together. We can do it. You know, I right. right. And, and, and just so you know, they can email Canine Global Rescue at info at canine. Okay. Um, and globalrescue.org, and they are a 501c3 American nonprofit organization, NGO. So they can do that, but uh, you know, we do vet people a lot. Um, well, I'm ready to go to Korea, I'm ready to go fight, I'm ready to go see this place. And honestly, we've taken people with us and learned from experience. It is not what you think it is. Oh, no. Like, so I, I need to prepare people. I need to vet them and make sure that they are capable 
some of them, and, and, and we have been in touch, touch a lot of veterans, uh, military veterans whose experience have been in touch with us. And, and again, I only expose them to what I think that I think that they can handle. Yeah. Like, not what they think they can handle. But what I, I think what you handle. have come to know can, can be handled. Well, God bless you, John. I mean, God bless you and everyone that's involved in this uh, organization and uh, you're doing the good work. And I do believe you will spell the end of it. You know, you've been I hope so. to God, God, God that it will. Yeah. Exactly. That's all we can do. And you're doing so much more than most of us. And so we will uh, be gladly supporting you. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the time, time Jacob. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye John. Bye.